And this is the cab coordinator. He's uh, responsible for the overall uh, operation, just kind of make sure that everything works smoothly. He's kind of like the fail-safe. In what's considered to be a high-tech job, some of the methods and equipment haven't changed for years. Details for every flight are logged on a paper strip. This is an arrival strip. It gives you the uh, call sign, the type of airplane, in this case, MD-80, that's American 724. So we get all information from these strips right here. And we have this very modern time stamping equipment, but I have to tell you, it's Y2K compliant, so that's good. It won't be affected at all by the Y2K computer bug on January 1st. <laughs> Delta 1842. The controllers are involved in a long-running battle with their employers, the Federal Aviation Administration, to persuade them to replace the antiquated equipment with the latest air traffic control technology. Timer 638, two left when you can join Bravo Ground Clearance along. I think uh, Fred Flintstone was probably the first guy who worked here at LaGuardia. And uh, I think most of the stuff that he used is probably still with us today. The radar we have now will have a blind spot where an airplane is. You look out the window and you go, there's the airplane. There's no building in the way, but he's not being picked up by the radar. Then on the other hand, that same radar who can't see the airplane in the air, you look over to the other side of the airport, basically along where the bridges are. And you see all these primary radar targets on the radar and you're thinking, is there a helicopter out there that we're missing? And what it is is tractor trailers that are traveling across that bridge. The radar is picking them up, but it's not seeing the airplanes. Trouble in the tower at LaGuardia Airport. An error almost causes a terrible mid-air collision. A U.S. Airways plane cleared to land. Just as an Air Canada flight is cleared to take off across its path. A passenger on U.S. Airways. We just kept getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And uh, finally, I think I just let out a yell, and a moment later, not because of the yell, but I think the pilots just pulled up and around. The controller had ordered the incoming blue plane to climb rather than land when he realized that the outgoing plane was late taking off. They only just missed. Depending on the reports, the difference between U.S. Air's tail and the bottom of Air Canada's fuselage, depending on which witness was interviewed and which story, anywhere from between 20 and 100 feet, I believe, are the figures. And uh, I didn't personally see that one, but I did speak to the controller who was uh, involved with that. And even though he followed all the rules, had the appropriate separation standards, it was still ugly. And uh, it was a very uh, scary moment, I can tell you that. We've never had a mid-air with two airplanes hitting at the intersection, and I, I pray to God that we never do. The fact of the matter is, close calls are occurring more and more. Clouds of black smoke from the downed and burning jetliner billowed thousands of feet into the air. In America's open skies, private plane owners have the right to fly almost anywhere. Passenger jets and light aircraft have been known to collide. Bodies and plane parts were scattered over In this accident over California, a Boeing 727 crashed into a Cessna, killing everyone in both planes and seven people on the ground. The PSA jetliner went down after colliding in midair with a Cessna 172. On board the smaller plane, a student pilot and an instructor. Both men died. More than 2,000 helicopters and light aircraft fly through New York's airspace every day. It's 6 p.m., rush hour at LaGuardia. Golf here, seven golf here. Phil Fabricatori is controlling helicopters and light aircraft in LaGuardia's airspace. Foley Motel trapped one mile south of the GW Bridge on the Harlem River at 1400 feet orbiting helicopter. Bravo airspace, 4 feet far, ready to search, terminate, free change, approved, traffic, 2 o'clock, 3 miles westbound, 1,400 feet, types unknown. You know where the big planes are going to be, because there it's all, you know, proceduralized. The pilots know what they're supposed to be doing. You know what the pilots are supposed to be doing, so you know where they're going to be. So it's the little guys that you have to watch out for. And during the summertime, with the float planes uh, coming in and out of Manhattan now for people going out to this, the Hamptons. You have the business helicopters flying in and out of Westchester and Teterboro into the city. 
you have the sightseeing helicopters going around the city and then you have everybody who wants to take a trip down the Hudson River to go see the Statue of Liberty and it's pretty much a free-for-all. And you can see a lot of the little helicopters run up and down the uh, city. You can see they're all like little gnats running around in the city there. You sir, 226, turn uh, left to join Bravo Ground Clear, and you take care now. How did that guy get there? Jim has spotted a rogue aircraft marked VI-01 on his radar screen. He's not out. Right now he's worried about a VFR target at 1,500 feet out there. Uh, some of the airplanes out the edge of our airspace can fly out there without talking to any air traffic controllers. And right now we have one right on the edge, and he's in a bad place right now. A light aircraft has strayed dangerously into the flight path of planes coming into land. Four mile final traffic off your right side, 1,600 southbound type unknown. Jim asks an incoming pilot if he can identify the mystery plane. And if you do uh, get a visual on him off the right side, let me know what type he is. Okay, 3759, left at echo, ground clearing. Sir, right now all I have out there is basically, uh, I see his altitude, I don't know what he is. I can pick up the binoculars and see if I can see that far, but I probably can't because it's kind of hazy. So, can't see him out there. So I'll ask the airplane that was closest to him, basically, do you know what he is? What type of airplane? Maybe we can figure out if it's a helicopter or whatever. My, they my say it's at 1,500 feet. That, uh, the guy on the harp tag reported him. Yeah, go ahead. So basically it's like a violator to our airspace right now, and uh, he's right in the middle of our file. It's no good. This is bad. So we'll deal with it, right? <laughs> in the tower, when something goes wrong, you have like a split second to analyze and react, or something very bad is going to happen. Commander 6 Sir LaGuardia, thanks for following Saab on a four mile final. You didn't happen to see uh, what type of aircraft that was, the violator that, that was on the base, did you? Uh, I couldn't, it, it was a small plane, like a Cherokee or something. Okay, thanks a lot. He says he thinks it's a Cherokee. This guy's lost. The, the Cherokee's kind of circling in that area, just uh, north of the field. Just kind of keep an eye on him, make sure that no one's going to hit him. USR 1843 LaGuardia Tower, thanks for number uh, three final regionals at a four mile final. Physics 513, runway 22, you cut a line. For the moment, Jim continues to let planes land and take off. For the next few minutes, they'll have to keep the jets out of the way of the violator. Yeah, we're watching them big time. This is kind of like right now, you're kind of doing both things. Looking out the window, looking on the radar to kind of watch what that violator's doing, because I can't see him visually. The only thing I can do is is watch what he's doing on the radar. The violator, VI-01, creeps further into their airspace. They can't speak to him because they don't know what radio frequency he's on. Hey, Bravo, come back, traveling 12 o'clock, two and a half miles, opposite direction. Uh, Phil Fabricatory warns a helicopter, call sign Bravo, Quebec, to keep clear. Hey, Bravo, Quebec, uh, use caution and uh, verify that's a Cherokee or a Cessna. His screen flashes up CA, conflict alert. The violator is on a collision course with Bravo, Quebec. It looks like maybe our, uh, our little violator there has figured out what his problem was, because it appears now he's going northbound, but uh, we'll see. The violator changes course and checks in with the tower. Shadow 9. You're kidding. No. Shadow 9 is a traffic spotter from a local news station. Is it Shadow? No, that's a guy who's ultimately familiar with the, uh, you know, the area. Knows He's one of the traffic spotter uh, guys. Knows the area in and out. He knew exactly where he was, so he shouldn't have been there. Shadow 9, right now you're at the edge of my airspace at 1,400 feet. Earlier, before, you were at 1,500 feet over the outer marker for runway 22, or landing runway 22. That's inside my airspace. Shadow 9, Roger. Understand you're going to stay north of Van Cortland Park now? 4683, LaGuardia, runway 13, position home. Shadow 9, 12 feet of Harvard, the surface is terminated. Freaks are changing the day. Man, that, you sound kind of all pumped up over here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'm not inside your airspace. Yeah, 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 you are. 
<laughs> Crazy. USA's 1157 LaGuardia. Thanks, Donald Traffic on a two mile flight. The threat of an accident hangs over the controllers every day. People deal with their stress of their job in different ways, but I tell you what, anyone in the tower will never forget those people on airplanes because they see what happens when airplanes crash off the end of the runway. They'll never forget. That's the big stress. There's plenty of guys just can't wait to move on, to do something else, retire. The stress affects people differently. Some guys thrive on it. Other guys, you know, after 10, 15 years of it, they might have thrived on it once before, but not anymore. And uh, I think that's, uh, I think you finally get to a point in your life where you have, you're full of that kind of stress and you get out. With many air traffic controllers opting for early retirement and not enough people being trained to replace them, there are fears that an already strained workforce may soon be pushed to the breaking point. Alitalia 767, either, uh, either to Milan or to Rome. John F. Kennedy is New York's largest airport. It's only 15 miles away from LaGuardia and Newark and handles a high proportion of international flights. What? The big one. Air traffic controller Dave Schoen. But it's interesting to meet people and hear, you know, you're an air traffic controller. Ooh, that's got to be stressful. And, you know, you look at them and you, if you're at a party or something, you take your soda and you go, nah, not stressful, you know. Where we are right now, we're in the northwest corner of the field along runway 31 left, which starts about two and a half miles that way and ends way down here towards uh, New York City. Uh, what you're looking at here, a jet taking off runway 31 left. You'll notice immediately as soon as he departs, he's got to make a left turn. That's to get away from Newark and LaGuardia traffic. On a day like today, they're in the clouds as soon as 300 feet. That's the last they're going to see land for a long time. The control tower is out there in the middle underneath the fog. Up there, you're insulated from a lot of the noise and the reality of it. When they fly by you here, the raw power of them is amazing. That's a Lufthansa 747 going to Germany. It's kind of wild, isn't it? Yeah, you barely see them for a few seconds. That you're feeling right there, that's wake turbulence. Okay, that wind just didn't just kick up. That's his wingtip vortices coming across and away. So that almost made my hat fly off, but uh, that's exactly what it feels like. It's very intense, and because the ground is dispersing it, it doesn't knock you over. You're in an airplane behind that. It's not the place you want to be. got to stay away from it. Weight turbulence is the biggest factor determining how closely the planes can follow each other. The larger the airplane and the slower the airplane, the worse the wake is going to be. A 747 can generate vortices that last up to three to four minutes and are mini tornadoes coming off the wingtips. You can actually see it today. If you watch the wingtips of these, you'll actually see it. The separation minimum between two DC-9s on final approach is two and a half miles. The closest I could ever be to that aircraft you just saw, a 767, is four miles, almost double. So you can fit, let's say, four or five DC-9s on the same approach. You could only fit three 767s. And you need that extra separation for wake turbulence, which is a very serious issue. As the planes get larger and larger, that becomes more of a problem as well.
Have you always wanted to try a low-carb diet but don't have the willpower to give up your favorite foods? Are you on a diet that makes you eat burgers without the bun and won't let you get near a piece of birthday cake? Well, now you can have your cake and eat it too with the Carb Fighter Natural Weight Loss System, an amazing breakthrough that lets you enjoy delicious pastas, fresh breads, mashed potatoes, and fattening desserts and still lose weight. Look, extra carbohydrates in your diet turn to sugar, which gets stored in the body as ugly fat. Fat. But Carb Fighter's six natural medically proven enzymes work with your body so extra carbohydrates are swept away safely before they turn to fat. Plus, the Carb Fighter system also reduces food cravings, boosts your metabolism, increases your energy, and stimulates weight loss 24 hours a day, even while you're sleeping. The Carb Fighter system has helped my patients to lose weight and to keep it off. It really works. On the Carb Fighter system, I didn't feel deprived. I had a lot of energy. I could eat what I want. I lost three inches on my waist. I was amazed. In the past, it was really hard on other diets trying to stay to a strict diet. Now with the Carb Fighter, I can eat whatever I want and still lose weight. Competitive products cost $40, but now you can eat bread, pasta, potatoes, and desserts and still lose weight with the Carb Fighter Natural Weight Loss System on this exclusive TV offer for only $19.99. Plus, you'll get the Carb Fighter Guide, filled with recipes and fitness tips for even faster results. A $15 value free. But that's not all. Call within the next 10 minutes and get a second bottle free. That's a 60-day supply, all for only $19.99. We guarantee you'll see a visible reduction in body fat in just two weeks or your money back. This amazing offer is not available in any store or catalog. So don't delay. Order the Carb Fighter System today. To order the Carb Fighter system, have your credit card or checkbook ready and call 1-800-421-0880 and get your second bottle of Carb Fighter absolutely free. Now enjoy your favorite food skill-free. Call now. Well, it's real action, and it's all real on TLC. The deputies are now chasing the suspect into the parking lot. Cameras on helicopters, police cars, and in the hands of bystanders. It's straight through their lens to your eyes. Witness dangerous highway pursuits and the training that cops do to keep us out of harm's way. See feats of superhuman strength and heroism. It's the kind of TV you just can't turn off. Tonight, starting at 8, here on TLC. Wednesday night, strap yourself in for a scrap smashing pedal to the metal double header. The Junkyard War semifinals. See sparks fly when the Long Brothers battle it out with the Texas Scrap Daddy. And the Art Attacks go head to head with the Young Guns. I don't know what you guys are thinking. Find out who powers their way to the top of the scrap heap. How confident are you about kicking a little booty? Finally, there's good trash on television. Kicking a booty? Junkyard Wars, Wednesday at 9, only on TLC. As the skies get more crowded, airports are getting overloaded. At Newark Airport on the other side of New York City, the safety gap between planes is being pushed to the limit. Newark is the New York area's busiest airport. One and a half thousand planes use it every day. It's 8 a.m. Controller Glenn Duffy is facing the daily headache of the early morning departure push. Allegheny 3963, uh, I can read you uh, clearly. Can you uh, copy me? Over the next two hours, Glenn will have to control 80 planes coming in to land. And for every two waiting to land, there are three wanting to take off. Every morning it's the same. Gridlock. Planes waiting for up to 45 minutes for their turn to take off. Delays are so regular that the airlines write them into their timetables. Air Jamaica 018 Heavy Newark Tower, caution weight turbulence in trail with a heavy DC-10 runway 4 left hand seat in a position and hold. How, how often do you go to take off on a landing? Uh, every minute. There's every, just about every minute there's a take off and a landing. Midway 861, taxi your caution weight 4 left and contact ground on point 8. Cross 4 left and then point 8, 861. Newark handles a mixture of large jets and small commuter planes, so calculating different safe takeoff intervals requires constant mental agility. 
me to 4660 contact New York to Portugal. Okay, because I've, I've got I've got to consider types. I and mean, this aircraft is just a, is a twin turboprop. He's a Beech 1900, and he's not as fast as the jet, this jet that's behind him. So I've got to let this aircraft fly a, a good mile or two before I can let this aircraft go. So that I'm going to guarantee to have three miles in between the two airplanes. Generally, I can roll one one if I have similar types. I can roll one type. Meet a 4660 contact New York to Portugal. Good day. I can launch one jet and then one jet another right behind him and I'll get the three miles instantly. Presumably you have to know everything about every plane. You have to, yeah, you have to take care of your air, aircraft uh, performance and capabilities you have to understand. Kind of depends on how many people they have on board, how much fuel they put on board, how much cargo. Delta 847 contact New York to Portugal. Good day. Continental 1451, wind 050 at 18, runway 4 left, cleared for takeoff. I mean, you start to even consider, like, this is a jet, but he's a 727. The 727 is a very old jet, and they don't climb very well. And especially in the summertime, when it's very hot and humid, they climb very slow, and, and, and they almost struggle to get in the air. And that's another thing. It's just a slow jet. I can't launch a very fast jet behind him because he's going to catch it. And it's very, very condensed airspace. There's a lot of traffic that's going over overhead this field up to the east and the west. Yes, got that. I got it. Air Jamaica 018 Heavy, wind 05017. Go ahead and monitor the tower. Looks like you'll be next to go. You have a good day. Air Jamaica 018 Heavy. Newark Airport is renowned as the delay capital of the United States. There's probably about uh, about 25 aircraft just sitting at the runway, and uh, we are we are technically in departure delays right now, um, and it's just a lot of planes at once. Usually it's just multi taxis, which is causing the delay. Jelly 4224, hold short of runway four left and remain this frequency. Continental 302, taxi across runway four left and contact ground on point eight. Good day. Cross the left point eight. Good day. Pro 323, you can contact New York departure. Good day to you. There's now a long line of planes that have just landed. They have to cross the runway being used for takeoffs to get to the terminal. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll this regional jet off runway four left. As soon as that aircraft is clear of this intersection, I will uh, I will move this arrival aircraft across the inboard runway and get him on the way to the gate. As you can see, the aircraft is just starting to rotate now. You can see the lights lifting up off the ground. Continental 1979, taxi across from way four left, then contact ground on point eight. Across four left and ground point eight, come on, line take off, Canal 650 back. Aruba 720, wind 06015, from way four left, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff, four left, from way four left. just keep doing the same thing. Jet link 3578, hold short of runway four left and remain this frequency. Continental 143, Newark Tower, runway 4 left, taxi in a position at home. I'm constantly looking up at the radar, making sure they've got separation there. I'm looking at my runways to make sure I've got separation on the ground. And I'm also looking out in the sky to make sure that I've got visual separation with any airplanes that might be on my final, any airplanes that might be transferring through my airspace. So that's where the swivel head kind of came about, because you're constantly looking to the left, looking to the right, looking up, looking down, coordinating, and there's just a lot going on. Continental 302, once you exit hold short of runway 4 left. And say I'm working. It's a busy session, and I've got 10 people on final. My radar all of a sudden goes blank. Zero. Nothing on it. And at that point, when that radar goes out in a second, you're scrambling. Your brain's thinking, you're like, what am I going to do to separate these airplanes? And just about every time it does work out. There's equipment in the airplanes that is cutting edge equipment, whereas Newark Airport, we're getting our ground radar now that was built years ago. I am using equipment now that was probably built prior to me being born. American 515, contact New York to Portugal. Good day. In the past five years, the number of planes using Newark has gone up by 50%. But the number of controllers has stayed the same. It's just one airplane after another. You, every single minute you're departing airplanes and every single minute you're landing airplanes. There is no set number of how many flights can leave or depart this airport every day. It's, it's unlimited, however many of the airlines want to put in. And that's one of the growing pains we're having here at Newark. Um, some of the airlines and some of the major users seem to be 
putting more airplanes in this airport than this airport can accommodate. Glenn is supposed to stay on deck for two hours, but the intensity often forces him to take a break after just one. It's 8 p.m. at Kennedy Airport. Dave Schoen is starting the night shift. This is peak time for all the international departures. Entanglement. There you go. Since the airport is close to the sea, it's frequently covered in a blanket of fog. Eesh. But it's getting icky out there. Yeah. We can't see outside at all. So everything's done in memory and on the ground radar. Dave uses ASDE, the same ground radar that they've got at Newark. It shows anything that moves on the tarmac, but it can't identify aircraft type and can only be used as a guide to keep the planes apart. What are they going to do? Send it back 40 Roger. When able, follow the 